Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Natasha Loder, and I'm the health policy correspondent for The Economist. It's my great pleasure to be hosting this panel uh, today at the Greenwich Economic Forum. I'm delighted to have the chance to speak to some of the leading lights in global healthcare and investment. Uh, we're going to talk about their views on the healthcare landscape. It's been an incredibly tumultuous year, and the news just does not stop coming. Uh, on Monday, of course, we had the announcement there is a COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer that's extremely effective. Um, we have a lot to chew on on our panel, uh, what this past year has meant uh, for our panelists and what they think it means uh, for everyone else and what the opportunities are for the investment landscape. Um, before we dive in, I have a little bit of housekeeping for um, everybody on the call. Um, if you're having access um, problems, uh, please make sure you're using Google Chrome. Uh, we're using um, a Q&A function in the app, um, so please do send some questions in. Um, you can also use the networking function on the app, um, and you can search and connect with um, other attendees and sponsors. Um, and in addition to the Q&A, um, there's also live polling um, and discussions uh, from the other panels. So please do uh, engage with this content. Right. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, our fine panelists. Uh, with me today is Peter Kolchinski, who is the co-founder of uh, RA Capital Management. Uh, we have uh, Semene Pangalos, the executive vice president and president of Bias Pharmaceutical R&D at AstraZeneca. We have um, Annie Lamont, the founder and managing partner of Oak HCFT. And of course, there's uh, Michael Lukton, managing director and head of European Pharmaceutical Research at UBS. All right, and with that, we're going to start. Now, we're all very excited uh, this week, I hope you all are, I know I am, um, about the news uh, about the COVID vaccine. And so I wondered if we could start by talking about that, what the outlook is uh, for vaccines in the near term, and then what we will think about people who might be tempted to take uh, more than one vaccine as well. Um, I'll just start at the top of uh, my screen. Um, Peter, would you care to dive in? Um, yeah, I, I, your, your question threw me there. I, I didn't think that there'd be too many people that are dying to take more than one vaccine. I, I thought we might have a problem with, uh, you know, some people not embracing that these vaccines are in fact going to be pretty well characterized by the time they're launched um, and that they'd be safe and, and uh, you know, well worth taking. Um, I think what Pfizer uh, has shown us is um, that we can be really optimistic about uh, Pretty much every other vaccine that's in development that generates antibody levels that are, you know, in the ballpark of Pfizer's or higher, right? And um, 2021 is not going to be about who has a better vaccine. It's going to be about who has a good enough vaccine uh, and how many doses can they make in 2021. Every single dose, I think, that is going to be manufactured by any company with a vaccine that, uh, you know, is good enough is going to be needed uh, by some country in, in this world. We're not going to encounter, you know, an excess of vaccine that will have us starting to wonder which one's better until maybe, you know, sometime in 2022. Right. So um, I think now all eyes should be on manufacturing capacity and making sure that that rollout goes smoothly. And yes, it'll be interesting to see some of the data that emerge from other trials that are nearly done. It'll teach us a bit more about the distinctions between a few different vaccine types. But I'm optimistic that all of them are going to be are, are going to now turn out to be pretty good. And then over time, we'll learn about durability. Does it wane? Do we need booster shots down the road? Um, th that uh, mention of, of other trials is a fantastic segue to uh, Semeni, who is uh, with us on this panel uh, from AstraZeneca. Semeni, would you care to dive in on COVID vaccines? Yeah, absolutely. And um, first of all, it's fantastic news. And um, as has been just said, I think the fact that we have a vaccine targeted to the spike protein that has 90% efficacy. Um, there's news today from the Russian vaccine as well. They've said they've got 92% efficacy with just, you know, just in it with the 20 events. So 
take it with a pinch of salt. But ultimately, all of the vaccines that are currently in development are targeted from the spike protein. And so that suggests that neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein, T cell responses to the spike protein, and what's uh, what the correlates of immune protection are likely to be. And of course, the big question then is going to be how long lasting uh, are those effects? Is it 12 months? Is it 24 months? Is it six months? We don't know. All of the vaccines that are in advanced development right now are two dose regimens. So just to put it into context for you, because I think, you know, the, the game, you know, we're just at the beginning of the end, I think, versus the, uh, the, 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 the end of the beginning. But I think we are at the beginning of the end, but 1.3 billion doses is what Pfizer said they can make next year in 2021. You know, that's 650 million people. That's not a lot of the world's population. So you put, you know, we've, we've got commitments next year for 3 billion doses. I think we're going to have another billion or so. We're going to need several vaccines to work to start to make a dent into the world population. And of course, not everyone is going to be immunized. We want to start with the most vulnerable, with the older adults, um, with immune compromise. Actually, you know, we have to think also what we're going to do with immune compromised individuals. But I think the vaccine data also bodes well for the monoclonal antibodies that are in development. We've already seen the Lee and Regeneron report positive data in the treatment setting. So I, I think it's it, it's exciting, and I think we can start to see a little bit of that light at the end of the tunnel that now with these therapies, both the monoclonal antibodies and the vaccines and hopefully antivirals um, and other anti-inflammatories as well, we will start to get a grip of, of, on this virus and the pandemic. And hopefully, I would say by the middle of next year, start to get to a semblance of normality in terms of uh, getting returning back to normal life. I never thought I'd miss an aeroplane in an airport, but I do actually miss them right now and the downtime that they bring to be able to think and, and read a little bit. But I think it's gr overall great news. And you know, in terms of our, our vaccine in particular, the collaboration with Oxford, um, our, our phase three program across the UK, Brazil and Africa is almost fully recruited and almost fully boosted. We fully expect to get results um, before the end of the year and hopefully sooner rather. You know, we're optimistic and uh, our US study continues to recruit at pace. So a confirmation study would have dosed to get close to 50,000 people by the time we're done. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add on uh, vaccines? Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, what I was going to add is vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations save lives, right? Um, it it's gets into arms is, is really what the challenge is. And, and when you look through the scenario analyses that governments are currently running, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time to get that done. Um, and everybody's discussed the ultra cold storage that's required for the Pfizer vaccine. You know, many can probably, what their requirements are, which is probably better for the emerging markets. But the reality is it's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take multiple vaccines. And, and that's good that we have multiple shots at goal. goal but, but don't underestimate the, the time to a global vaccination program. Um, I'd, I'd like to turn uh, to whether we think the public will have um, any confidence in this. Um, Annie, do you have any thoughts on this subject about you know, vaccine confidence and whether or not uh, people are going to have trust and faith um, in this product? Yes, I think it's a it's an incredibly important question. I I do think that frankly a Biden administration um, will give um, more confidence. Um, I know that in the state of Connecticut, and I know California's done this, and a number of the other states, but we've created a vaccine vaccine council, not mm -hmm. only filled with scientists but also different um, members of different communities that would help validate a vaccine and make people feel. Uh, comfortable that the science that we're leading with the science, and that it's first of all safe, and also efficacious. So I, I think that um, I think particularly with the second wave or whatever you know what you want to call it, um, I think people are going to be more anxious to take it. I think they're going to be you know I think that if uh, state governments along with uh, the Biden administration validates it, I, I think that people will feel more confident. Does anyone else have any thoughts on vaccine confidence? Uh, so many. I'd be interested in your thoughts about uh, trust and faith in vaccines. 
Look, I, th I think the, the reality is we're all moving very fast. I think we'll all have dosed tens of thousands of patients. So these aren't small vaccine studies that are being run around the world across very broad demographics, across ethnic minorities, across geographies. So I think people should have confidence in the data we generate, but ultimately we will need to follow people out for several years and everyone will be following out for two years. And that will give us more data about safety and immunogenicity. Now, mRNA vaccines are a new technology. Uh, adenovirus-based vaccines a little bit less so, but ultimately, you know, the best way of generating confidence is showing and being very transparent about the safe data that we have so far, the patients and the, uh, that have been dosed, the side effects that we see, and ultimately the efficacy that we see. And we will need to continue to follow all of those individuals as we roll out vaccination programs, which I completely agree are going to take time. And I think we, we shouldn't underestimate how challenging it's going to be to vaccinate populations um, uh, over, over a period, um, as well as the challenges for some of the supply chains, because, you know, you know minus 80 degree vaccines are not, not something that are going to be particularly used to do in the developing world in particular. Um, but, you know, I, I think given the pandemic, given how much people want to get back to normal, I fully expect we'll be able to vaccinate people and people will take the vaccine. One just follow up question on that. Um, I think there's a widespread assumption uh, that all the leading vaccines, including yours, will um, first, you know, move out of trials through some sort of emergency authorization process. And, you know, as you pointed out, um, there are these are new platforms and we have a limited amount of safety data for them. Um, do you have some kind of expectation for what kind of, you know, trade-offs that regulators are going to have to make when they consider this in the sense that, you know, if they do a quite broad emergency authorization, um, you know, we don't have a lot of safety data and you might want to restrict it to, you know, a small number of people and do follow-up studies. And also if you make a broad, um, you know, if, if Pfizer, for example, had a broad um, emergency authorization, um, that could also interfere with follow-up trials. So I wonder if you could just perhaps give me, give us some of your insight into kind of what factors regulators have to consider um, when they consider giving um, emergency authorizations for these novel vaccine platforms in particular? So um, what they have to consider is the totality of the data, both safety and efficacy and the overall risk benefit. Um, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not, you know, the committee met um, um, last month that actually suggested in the US we might not get EU author emergency authorization vaccines. They may just go to full approval um, with the data sets that they have. And I think that's also the case in the end with the MHRA and EMA. You know, we're talking about the data sets that we will provide that will be sufficient for full approval, not just for emergency use authorization. But as I said previously, we will need to continue to follow patients up for two, at least a two year period. Right, which will further right. give further confidence to individuals. But if you think about new vaccines as they're rolled out, whether it's for uh, shingles or meningitis, you know, we, we have, we will have dosed a lot of individuals around the world with different technologies targeting the same type of protein, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. So I, I think the world should hopefully feel reasonably confident, but it will feel more confident as time goes by. Um, but I know. I think the data sets that we are ultimately generating, we want to be fit for full approval, not just emergency use authorization. All right, well, thank you for that. Let's talk a little bit um, about the sort of more meta level of uh, what's going on in healthcare at the moment. Um, you know, obviously, COVID has brought issues like health security and innovation um, into the spotlight. Um, as well as, um, you know, completely transforming how healthcare is delivered. Um, you know, people are using Zoom um, to do uh, their medical appointments as well. Um, can we, I'm going to turn to each of you in turn, and I, I want to ask you kind of what changes you see in the short term in the sector going forward. I mean, purely from your perspective um, and uh, knowledge, please. So I'll start with you, um, Peter, please. 
So um, I, I'm, uh, you know, keeping an eye on the public discourse on drug pricing, right? And uh, it was really great to see the enthusiasm um, for uh, all of the different projects that sparked up in COVID, uh, in the response to COVID. Uh, and yet, you know, COVID has been a microcosm really for us for all of healthcare. Uh, if you think about patients with diabetes, that's their personal COVID. You know, breast cancer, that's their personal COVID. You know, people become really attentive to the innovation that's going on in all these different fields. So we've seen for a long time growing enthusiasm in neurodegeneration. And we're making huge strides uh, in um, our ability to target, uh, you know, what's going wrong in people's brains when it, it uh, and nervous systems when it comes to, uh, say, Huntington's disease uh, or ALS. And these aren't uh, necessarily, it's not going to be progress that people see in the next uh, year or two necessarily in terms of drugs being approved. But for those of us that follow the details, the way the public is now following the details of every single COVID trial, you know, it's actually quite exciting. Um, and so um, I hope that the same way that even though we've heard rhetoric about drug pricing when it comes to, uh, you know, COVID and you get groups like ICER that do some math that try to convince you that remdesivir is worth less than a bag of saline, um, that ultimately we, we don't lose sight of the fact that it's exciting to have this tiny little segment of the population on, on earth working this hard towards progress that uh, permanently retires our fear of a given threat. Um, I, I love the way you got the dig in uh, for ISA because Peter and I, um, uh, you know, uh, have differing opinions on the value of qualies. And as you might imagine, the economist uh, thinks that um, uh, uh, measuring outcomes is quite a good thing. Um, so, so many, I wonder I'm if you sure could. Uh, I, I was surprised by that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I apologise, um, but yes, I, 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 we do think we do think that um, measuring outcomes and using qualities is is quite valuable. Um, so many, I wonder if I could turn to you and ask. You can just call you, me many, by the way. You don't call me so many. Just many is fine. I'm just a many. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, Mene, great. Um, I wonder if you could basically um, talk to me about, you know, what shifts you see um, from your perch at Astra going forward, you know, how's it changing what you're doing? I mean, here's the thing, of course, Astra's never really been into vaccines, but now you have um, this technology uh, that you're working on, are you going to move into vaccines? Um, so Actually, we, we make a flu vaccine, and we have a, an anti-RSV antibody in phase three, and a drug called Synergist. But we're not we're not a we're not a big vaccine company like GSK or, or Sanofi. But, but look, I think we've got to wait for our results before we get uh, too excited about new areas that we want to be in. We, we felt that we could help Oxford and do something that was good for society and the, and the world, and, and hopefully we can show that we've done that um, in, in a few weeks' time. Look, I think what we've learned is, um, is we've learned several things, and I think we've been on a digital journey um, over the past couple of years. And what I think the pandemic has done is accelerated, you know, or put it on a, on steroids, as they say, because everything's had to move, you know, at triple the pace. So if you think about how we've enabled the continue, continuation of our clinical trials, whether they be late stage trials or mid stage studies, how we get our medicines to patients versus clinical trial sites. We've had to work out how to get um, drug supply to people's houses, how to interact and engage with patients virtually through digital tools, how to do um, patient analysis of efficacy, whether it's spirometry or blood sampling with, uh, with home visits. I mean, really, you know, moving to almost a sightless um, uh, trial basis for the majority of our programs, because that's been really the only way to continue. Um, so it's been a huge transformation. Of course, I think this is something that is out here to stay because it's obviously a better experience also for the patients. The trials become more cost effective and in some cases can also be sped up. I think the other thing that we've seen is a very different type of interaction with regulators. And of course, I don't think the regulators are going to be working like this with us on a, on a daily basis for every program, but the um, interactive nature of the interactions with the regulators, the back and forth, the working together to solve problems. I hope at least some of that can continue, particularly in areas of biomedical need where 
there's a real patient need and benefit to doing so in terms of accelerating uh, progress. And then the final piece is just in, in our research, approach, if you think about moving a monoclonal antibody program, which we've done actually two monoclonals, because it's an antibody cocktail, from idea to phase three and hopefully launch in about you know, somewhere between 12 and 18 months, that would normally take us about five years. <laughs> And that's uh, for a really successful, rapid program. Um, so we're doing things at a speed that we've never done before. And that's not at the expense of quality or cutting corners. It's a lot of parallel processing, a lot of upfront investment and a lot of risk taking in terms of how you go about running your program. But I think what that's taught us is that there are, in some areas where it's maybe particularly competitive or particularly exciting, there are ways that we can move things even faster than we normally do. Probably I would say a little bit more like a biotech does because, you know, when a biotech only has one program, all their attention is focused on that. What I've seen with our antibody programs and the vaccine programs is the organization is 150% focused on generating the data. And so it's almost like this um, obsession of getting it done 24 seven. The teams aren't waiting for decisions from senior leaders or from governors, but they're just getting on and doing things. And that is really speeding things up in terms of how we work. So I think that there are, there's a whole raft of things that I think we will take away from the pandemic and, will change, and it will change how we work. Thank you. Michael, I want to turn to you and I also, with the same sort of question, but I wonder if you have thoughts on kind of how capital allocation and investment might change kind of given the year that we've just had, or are we after COVID, are we just going to, you know, go back to, you know, doing cancer and um, things like that in the same, in the same way that we were, you know, will it be speed business as usual in 2019? Yeah. So I was going to add a little bit from my perspective. So, it's been an interesting year because we've seen a lot of retail investing or thematic investing in, in the sector um, and, and almost breaking the rules or breaking the mold of, of how money was put to work. And that sort of was the first nine months of the year. And then an election happened and, and all of a sudden the sector, the pharma sector ended up on a, on a substantial discount to, to the market. Um, because people were worried. So it's almost like a year of two halves and, and that dust still needs to settle. And um, we've seen a huge rotation and repositioning over the last week or so um, with, with people being caught in that traffic. And, and I think that still needs to get out of the way before people can think about maybe more fundamental approaches to, to, to how they allocate capital. Um, I, I, I completely agree with what many were saying in terms of um, Sort of the speed and nimbleness of the industry. I think pharma used to be quite stuck in its ways, and and what the pandemic has really shown us is how how agile some of these companies can be, uh, also the very large ones. And I'm really curious to see how the industry is learning from this and, and what will stick next year. You know, think about congresses as being digital now. You audio people don't have to go to them. Um, you can do digital launches um, if the audience is for for, for receiving the, the the message, then, then it can work very, very efficiently. We've seen that in in areas like SMA, I think. So, so there's there's really interesting stuff happening here. I think I would think the industry is going to continue to follow the science. Um, I'm not sure the pandemic's going to move that significantly, but but the speed, seeing things done in weeks that normally would take years, is is extraordinary and really encouraging. Um. Thank you for that. I'm going to turn to you, Annie, for your views as well. I also have a specific question that has come through the app for you. And um, as a, a science-based writer, I have to say, I'm not sure I entirely understand it. So I'm going to just going to read it out. Maybe you could, um, you know, your, your explanation will make it clear what it means. The question is, um, as growth investors, how should we manage the risk reward exit strategies during the crisis? Um, so, that's the question I've had. And also, um, if maybe you could also reflect on uh, what this year has meant for your your area going forward, that would be helpful. Sure, sure. And to set the context, so we do not invest in anything like drugs that depend on the FDA. 
Um, we were all technology enabled solutions and services in healthcare. So think of it that way. And it can serve pharma or employers, payers, providers, you know, or be a provider. Um, and it's been an extraordinary year for us. Um, I, you know, I think I, the perspective we had in March is very different than the perspective we have today. I would say the, the trends that we've been investing in for the last decade have been virtualization, home care, mental health, primary care. I mean, all of those things have been dramatically accelerated the last six months. I mean, our companies are growing at twice the rate they were growing a year ago. Um, it is it is lifted, and I think you know part of it is behavior change. I mean, clearly this the need for virtualization, um, the understanding of it is, has changed. Reimbursement has also changed. That when you're when you're reimbursing a provider in the same way for a virtual experience as you are for in person, that dramatically changes their behavior. Um, but it goes beyond just the the doctor visit. Um, it's really a perspective about home care least cost setting, you know, our mission has been to lower costs and improve quality. And we've been on that mission for 20 years. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, for example, who wants to be in a nursing home right now? You know, in the enabling of home care in a smarter way than we've been doing in the past, we've had the technology, we just really haven't had the will um, to do it. And I think that is dramatically changing. We're seeing our home care companies growing. Um, and that, you know, if you think about that experience in the home, it's a much richer experience now with the ability to uh, prescribe, diagnose with you know home you know home COVID kits, uh, home you know other diagnostics as well as telehealth as well as prescribing capability you know all in one you know service. It's just it is changing the experience of healthcare uh, for Americans, and I think that is going to be an incredible boost in terms of fundamentally lowering cost in the future. Um, if you look at what's happened in prim the primary care side, you know, we've had two companies, uh, one medical um, and Oak Street go public. We were actually then one of the leads in, in one medical, and that is just a different primary care experience. Um, we're involved in Village MD, and Walgreens has invested in them a uh, billion dollars in them recently. Uh, and I'm going to be rolling out that experience of primary care at risk across 500 Walgreens stores. So you're, you're literally changing the whole dynamic and relationship of primary care uh, with consumers across America. So, I, you know, we're super excited. I mean, mental health, that is a topic. I mean, mental health just hasn't been reimbursed or has been part of the benefit in the way that it's needed to be. And employers and others are realizing, obviously, we have a mental health crisis. We had it before COVID and we have a much deeper crisis now. And so I am seeing many more resources going to that, much more care and attention going to that by CMS, by payers. Um, so that to me is exciting and transformative. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I actually think it's been a really good thing for the healthcare system. And then with the specific question that was asked yeah. on risk reward exit strategies, I believe it was. So um, risk reward exit strategies, I, I think the fascinating thing is the IPO market, you know, has, has really been closed for companies under a billion dollar valuation uh, for a very long time. Um, I'd say the IPO market is still not, uh, you know, uh, welcoming of those uh, companies. But I think that with the growth and scale of what's happening in healthcare, we have had so many more IPOs this year than in the past. The IPO market is robust and that creates more exit opportunities. Um, it's also on the strategic side. I think there are many more um, strategic sales going on. Also PE, uh, you know, we do uh, early all the way to growth and we even participate in buyouts. So we're all across the spectrum in terms of our investment strategy, but we are seeing many more PE classic companies that would not have been coming into our company. I mean, Carlisle is a great example of a company that looked at one medical uh, and invested in them prior to the IPO. I think their value is close to $5 billion in the public market. Carlisle came in maybe a year and a half ago to $1.6 billion. Six. People were shocked at the valuation. But Carlisle, as a PE LBO firm that's usually looking at EBITDA, positive EBITDA, looked at this as a growth company losing money, but invested in growth and gave them a valuation of think like a tech company because it is a growth company with a massive TAM, a massive market opportunity. So I think, you know, liquidity 
is going to be like much is much greater with many more avenues to liquidity uh, for healthcare entrepreneurs. Um, just one quick follow up on um, the sort of he healthcare changes. Uh, sorry, the healthcare ecosystem changes. There's a debate about kind of like how sticky a lot of uh, these shifts to virtual healthcare are. Do you have a view about this? Because there is this argument, isn't there, that some people will go back and some people will not. Some people will want face to face, right? And some people will not. Do you have a view on that? You're asking me. Yes, I'm sorry, Annie. Yes, I wondered if you, you know, how much, I mean, if we see uh, you know, a big shift. Yeah, sure. I, I, yeah. I mean, do, do you think we'll see some? Yeah, I think it, so it, think about it like e think about it like an e-commerce experience, um, in that people want omni-channel, and so I think you can't just offer a digital experience. I think it has to be, you know, you have to be able to have an in-person experience. Uh, we also invest in fintech, and you think about those opportunities. Actually, most of those are uh, you can have almost every digital experience from your bedroom. You know, like buying a mortgage, essentially, you know, getting a mortgage, getting a loan, um, paying people, you know, uh, you know, payments can all be done digitally. But the reality is, is healthcare does need an in-person experience. Um, so I think there will be, you know, if there was a spike in virtualization and the telehealth experience in the second quarter into the summer, um, that to me just started a trend. Um, but it, there will be some normalization of that. But I, I think, again, it, you can't just think of it as the telehealth to, to doctor you know, experience. It's really about enabling an entire industry around home care um, and the virtualization of that care um, and keeping people in their home. Um, and so I, I think of it as diagnostic, prescribing, um, you know, caregiving, many, you know, many more of those experiences now can happen successfully in the home, but we do need a, it's an omni-channel experience. And, you know, our view is what you're really trying to do is keep, have people go to the lowest cost setting for whatever their experience is. If you think about something like Dispatch, I mean, Dispatch is a company we've invested in Colorado and it has car and the car is an advanced medical experience. It is a hospital in a home experience. So the, the car is coming to your home and preempting you from going to the hospital because there's nothing more expensive than getting admitted to a hospital. Um, and that and dispatch is going to be a two hundred million dollar. It's company gone from zero to two hundred million in just a few years. It's going to be a billion dollar company very shortly. Um, this is a, an experience that is rolling out in Connecticut and Hartford right now um, and is going to be something that absolutely uh, preempts cost in other in other ways. So people are getting very creative about lowering costs and giving a much better consumer experience. Um, thank you for that. Um, when we close the session, um, one of the questions, the question I will ask is um, to make some predictions about um, what you think is exciting in healthcare, kind of at the medium term horizon, what it's going to look like. Um, and we're talking about, you know, five years plus. And I just, I see that idea because you might want to think about it now because the kind of chunkier question I want to deal with before that um, is, uh, about the FDA. And so uh, we've seen that the FDA can uh, move quickly uh, to develop, uh, um, sorry, to um, work with firms on vaccines. And uh, one of the questions in the app is, you know, whether the, the changes at the FDA um, kind of, you know, will have any impact on um, how they work in the future. So there's that question. And then kind of related to that, I also wonder if um, you, you know any of the panelists have some thoughts about um, how the FDA uh, could perhaps uh, regain um, some of the confidence um, that has traditionally been given uh, to it that I would say has been a little bit eroded by some of its actions this year. Um, so uh, to start with the FDA question, um, I will go to Peter if that's okay. And then I'm gonna to come to you next, Mene. Sure, so, um, and Mene, I'd love your, your thoughts on this uh, too, because I feel like we're kind of in this together uh, to the extent that we're trying to anticipate what society wants in the future, right? You know, uh, 
uh, AstraZeneca sells some existing drugs now, but it's also an investor in new drugs. And that's what RA Capital does. We're you know, almost exclusively an investor in drugs that are in development. And understanding what the FDA considers clinically meaningful is absolutely critical to our ability to make uh, you know, decisions about where to direct society's capital. Um, and when the FDA is consistent, we can do our jobs. When the FDA you know, seems to be changing the goalposts, uh, we can adapt if we have good, clear communications with the FDA. But whenever we're surprised, um, that makes us question everything we know about the FDA's goalposts in every disease. People start saying, oh, well, don't worry, that's just the neuro division or that's just the oncology division. Um, but you still need that consistency from the uh, FDA as the arbiter of what is clinically meaningful. Um, but, uh, you know, I will mention again this you know, concern about price. There seems to be the rise of a new arbiter um out there you know payers uh and you know groups like nice in the uk have long had influence over what the uk says it will pay for drug there's really no point to inventing a drug that the fda or ema approves if then there's another ultimate arbiter a payer that says yeah but we won't pay for it like at, at that point it's like well then that's the final word i wish i hadn't invented it when it's just the uk doing it you know and sort of and I, I could go at length about it, but I won't. Like basically running math formulas to try to make every drug look like it's overpriced, just so the UK can get a discount. Admirable policy to save the UK money, but you know it still just means that someone's got to pay the difference in order to sustain innovation. I mean, the entire industry operates off of collective profit margins of just ten percent. So there's not nearly the fat that people think there is in this innovative ecosystem to to cut costs. So when the U.S. starts flirting with it and talking about it seriously and, and Natasha, even The Economist says, yes, we should do math after the fact to determine what price control to put on something that was just launched. It means that maybe it doesn't matter so much anymore what the FDA thinks is clinically meaningful. We have got to have dialogue with the people that are going to be setting price after the fact and figure out how are you doing your math? Tell us now if you're going to value cancer drugs or Huntington's drugs like you value antibiotics today, and we won't waste our money pursuing that innovation, right? So um, I, 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 would, I, I, I would argue, I, I yeah, would please. argue that it's it's a price signal rather than uh, setting it after the fact. And if we had in Britain uh, the ability for pharma companies to set prices, um, then. Uh, you know, the, the cost of buying innovation from biotech companies would just go up because the market would be bigger. So I think it's valuable to have oh, a yeah. price signal. You'd pay, you'd pay more, but that doesn't mean you're overpaying. My argument is the UK is underpaying for its share of what it gets from drugs. Meanwhile, it's succumbing to the growing rents of healthcare services that Annie's trying to counteract in other ways. I'm not sure I agree. I'm not sure I agree with that, actually. Just to be, I don't think that's, a, I think that's an overgeneralization of, of, of the world. And I think, that, first of all, the F regulators don't determine the value of anything. What the regulators determine is risk benefit. So they look at, uh, they look at the, the, the unmet medical need and they look at the overall efficacy profile and the safety profile. They determine whether a medicine is fit to be used widely and approved in that particular indication. The payers, as you point out, are the ones that determine the value. In the US, it's a very different system because it's a private insurance system generally, in addition to the government owned systems. And Europe is very different to the US in terms of prices. The UK is not, uh, you know, whilst it ha does have low pricing for certain types of medicines, it depends what type of medicine you're talking about. Uh, so does Europe, so do other countries in the world. I think, you know, that there's a, a disparity between regions and geographies around pricing and different. Governments and different uh, regions have different priorities in terms of what they view as their healthcare needs and what they deem as value for money and what they're prepared to pay. Um, the reality is you have to be able to demonstrate why your medicine is worth paying for, right? You have to have the right comparators, you have to write the efficacy, you have to have the right safety. When we start a research and development program, we very much at the beginning of the process and all through development think about that value proposition. Why would anyone want to reimburse it? 
why would a physician want to prescribe it and why would a patient want to take it? And if you can't generate that data, um, we, wouldn't, we, we, we won't work on the program. Um, now, with regards to the question you're asking about regulators, I would say um, it's, it's hugely challenging. Yes, they've been incredibly um, good to work with, I would say, generally. Inconsistent, but still generally all good to work with during the pandemic, all wanting slightly different things. If you go to the real world, you know, the normal world, where we're talking amongst different divisions of the FDA, and you compare the oncology division to the respiratory, I mean, that they're, it's like different planets in terms of how they work and, and what risk they tolerate and what, what evidence they want and how they use safety data and preclinical data to make decisions. And that's also true around the world where you have European regulators or the MHRA wanting very different things, different comparisons, because ultimately standards of care are also quite different. But that adds huge complexity and cost to development. When you have to run an asthma study and one country wants you to compare exacerbation rates you know, across one certain set of comparators and another country wants you to compare against another set of comparators and one group wants lung function and the other group wants exacerbations, you end up having to run two or three large phase three pivotal programs to be able to get a global approval around the world. It would be wonderful if we could try and get some alignment, but the reality is medical practice around the world is practiced differently. And so you have to adapt and adjust. So there will always be some complexity. I think the regulators could work to have it less complex than it is today and have a little bit more alignment. And what I have seen happen now during the pandemic, as everyone becomes desperate for therapies, for vaccines, antibodies, antivirals, is they have started to align a little bit more closely about what level of efficacy they want, what the lower bounds of confidence interval need to be, what the safety databases need to look like. And they're talking to each other to try and make it a little bit easier for us to generate one data set versus four or five data sets. It would be very nice if we were doing that for other disease areas as well. I think that the, the concern I've got is that if America were to adopt the UK's notions of what a life is worth and what a benefit is worth, um, all the work that you guys are doing would be decimated, as would you know funding for innovation. Across you're, the you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The, 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 the pricing model in the US is very different. You know, the benefit of the pricing model in the US is what happens in the US is that innovation is adopted very quickly. So patients get access to the newest medicine as a consequence of being able to get them a, a, a premium prices, right, very quickly, right? And, dr and drugs are launched very quickly in the US. The consequence of the UK having a much more challenging pricing environment and reimbursement conversation is that many oncology drugs aren't launched in the UK. So patients don't but get the standard. They'll eventually go, go yeah, generic and they get, them, get they get them but printing it later. That's right. But it's, but I'm, but the point I'm trying to make is it does also depend. On, I, I think there are lots of, I absolutely believe that demonstrating value for money for a medicine is critically important. Oh. Right? Whatever region you're in, and there has to be good value. But, you know, you look at how cardiovascular drugs are adopted or uh, respiratory drugs, different drugs are adopted in different ways in different countries. So I completely agree the U.S. is the best at adopting innovation and paying for it. Um, but I think other regions do it, and it's all ultimately all a balance of budgets and uh, an what, economic what? scale. I'm going to have to step in there. I'm so sorry. This has been a fascinating no, no discussion. Worries. I'm really sorry, but I'm getting um, I'm getting some pressure from uh, the producers to wrap this up. Um, I did want to talk about um, five and ten year horizons. We sadly don't have time for that. Um, Peter, I'm always happy to debate um, drug pricing with you offline. Thank you all so much. Um, it's definitely all we've got time for today. And thank you all, uh, panelists. You've been fantastic. That last discussion was um, gripping for me anyway. Um, uh, it's a crucial time for healthcare and public health around the world. Um, I'm sure the audience um, uh, enjoyed that. And thank you to, to the audience for taking part. Um, in our next session, uh, after this, you will be hearing about digital currencies joining the mainstream um, before a panel on the outlook for the world in 2021. Uh, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mene, Annie and Michael for your time. Much appreciated.